Welcome, everybody. So we are in, now we're almost reaching the end of the, our series of seminars uh, on information systems. And uh, yeah, today we have a pleasure to have a talk with Michael Erskine from the Middle Tennessee State University in the USA. He's going to talk about task technology fit and geospatial reasoning. And uh, in par particularly, this is going to be the first time that Michael and I we meet face to face, right? Even though it's, yes. it's going to be the first time. We have been talking a lot via email yes. and... Uh, For years uh, and years. <laughs> yeah, years and years. Uh, I think in the beginning of my PhD in 2013, yes, or 14, yes, I think yes. we did the first uh, connection, right? Yes, I believe so. It was right after the AMSIS in Chicago. Exactly. That was in 2013, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Exactly. And after that, we, we somehow it, we keep in touch, right? Uh, via email, exchanging papers, ongoing work. But this is going to be the first time that we really see each other, even though it's virtual. But uh, yeah, it's very... So for me, it's very special that uh, Mike accepted my invitation. And uh, I, I, just before we start the talk, I want to thank you for accepting, again, the invitation and make your time free for being here and uh, talk with, uh, with our students from in Brazil and uh, in Latin America as well. Okay. So, Michael, thank you very much again for accepting the invitation. And uh, as we say here, the floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you very much. It's a real honor to be here. Um, as Claudia was mentioning a little while ago, it, you know, it's a huge honor because we've been meeting virtually via email and I think chat even in the earlier days since 2013 or 2014. Um, so when he invited me to this, I was really excited to be here and, and have this virtual opportunity to meet in person and to do a presentation. And so this topic that I want to talk to today, talk to you about today is um, something that's really passionate to me. And so this notion of decision making using geospatial data and then also the role of task technology fit. So uh, what I want to do, whoops, give me a sec. Here we go. So that's me, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm from Middle Tennessee State University. So it's in a town called Murfreesboro, Tennessee, which you probably have never heard of, but you probably have heard of the city that's close to here, and that's Nashville. So Nashville is, is essentially the music capital or the country music capital here in the United States. Um, you have most of the major record labels, um, everything Warner Music, Spotify, Universal Music, all the country groups, uh, all the country um, music area, like studios and recording studios. There's so many of them here in Nashville. Um, but, you know, Tennessee is not just about music. There's a lot of other things here. Um, healthcare is huge. So it's probably the healthcare capital of the U.S. And when I talk about healthcare, I'm not talking about actual hospitals, but, um, the, you know, the technology and the organizations that run those hospitals. There's also quite a bit of finance, and especially, I think this will accelerate with the pandemic, but we've had um, some major finance corporations move into Tennessee, um, and that is Caterpillar. You're probably familiar with them, but um, Cat Financial, which is their... Um, their lending arm, as well as Alliance Bernstein, which is a finance company from New York that had moved their headquarters down to Nashville as well. And uh, we have some automotive here, um, which I know you have a lot in Brazil as well. So we have, um, it's in Kentucky, just north of um, Nashville, there's uh, the Corvette plant. We have the Volkswagen plant for the United States here. Uh, we also have um, General Motors and the Cadillac plant. So, and Nissan um, for pretty much the US and I believe Canada um, has their factory here as well. Then there's all sorts of other industries, big logistics hub as well because Tennessee is sort of centrally located so it can move lots of freight truck based shipments um, up and down the East coast of the United States. So that's a little bit about Tennessee. Um, if you're ever in this area, do let me know and I will be happy to meet with you and show you around. It's a fun time. So myself, I have my PhD in computer science and information systems from the University of Colorado in Denver. I, and, um, I finished that program in 2013. And since then, I've actually worked in university administration um, for an IT department. And since then, since 2017, I've been here in Tennessee teaching um, in the information systems program. And so the reason I mentioned, you know, geospatial decision making, it has a big role in my life. And that's because prior to um, studying information systems, uh, I actually worked in the surveying and mapping industry. So, you know, I was out there in the field and we were doing, um, back then it was all about cell towers, right? Communications towers and antennas for cellular devices. And essentially what we did is we tried to determine where those should go. And it's not just a matter of using a GIS or using a system to make that decision, but it's also finding out where the utilities are located, who owns the land, how can we negotiate? So there's a lot of pieces to that. Um, and that's really fascinating. And that sparked my interest in uh, surveying mapping and of course mapping and then GIS um, decision support systems using geospatial data. And that brought me to this presentation today. <laughs> so, so what I wanna do is kind of talk a little bit about um, geospatial analytics and making decisions using geospatial data and then run through two experiments that I did. And those were published research papers. I believed um, you actually done one as part of this um, and 
probably read it or read parts of it, which was the apartment finder experiment. So I'll talk about that one as well as the coffee shop experiment, and then do an overview that kind of brings everything together and looks into the future of where things might go um, with what we're talking about today. And I'll do my best. So I know there's the chat. I'll try to monitor that. Um, I think there's a little audio cue that will let me know if there's a chat post. I'll look into that. Um, if I don't answer you or don't get to it, um, don't worry. I'll try to answer your questions at, at the end of the presentation. But I'll do my best to monitor it, like I said. All right. So, you know, when we talk about location analytics, geospatial data, a lot of times it's confusing of what exactly, you know, what exactly is he talking about or why is this important? So there's a couple of key things I have on the slide. And this is really in the business world, but uh, location analytics are making decisions using geospatial data that actually can be a strategic advantage for a company. So if an organization understands that data, understands how to work with that data, they can actually separate themselves um, from their competitors and make some decisions that their competitors may not be able to do, um, which is really exciting because there's different techniques, there's different types of data that you look at and I think about 11 different types of relationships that aren't available um, unless you're doing a geospatial analysis. So you can dig into that data um, quite a bit more, which is fascinating. Um, I know that some of these stats that I have are a little old here, 94 and 97. Uh, it's as best I could find. I think those numbers are actually higher today. But uh, the thought is that, you know, when you look at business data, 75% of it contains spatial information. And I absolutely believe that. And it's probably more than that, as I said. And so you might be thinking, well, what exactly does that mean? Well, when you think about logistics, for example, everything that's being shipped, every item, every truck, every vehicle, every asset, um, we should know where those are located. So there is a geospatial component there. And also we know where they came from, where they're going, how long it took. And the same thing goes with your customers. Uh, most likely you will have some sort of address information of where that customer resides. And again, you have some information about um, that particular customer or a protocol from that area so you kind of know um, who your customers are coming from and there's a lot of things that we can look at um, you name a business decision most likely i can help you find the spatial piece of that and the second um, figure I have up here is 80% of business decisions utilize spatial information. Um, again, I think that that's more. And when I say utilize, I, I think I should actually say could utilize. Um, so when we look at business decisions, there probably is a spatial component that could go into the decision. And oftentimes, I do not think it's done effectively. And that is why this work, I think, is so critical, is to help business decision makers make those decisions and understand how to use um, the location components to drive to better decisions. So that's an area I'm passionate about, and maybe we can talk about that a little bit later on as well. Um, the next piece I have here is social media content contains spatial data, and that is especially why I think those other two numbers are a little bit low, because obviously since 1994, 1997, you know, social media is, um, and, um, you know, with that, most pieces of information, you know, we know where people are, we know who's going to what restaurants, we know where they're posting their um, images from, you know, whatever tool you're using, we can generally scrape that data and find out where they're from, or they've tagged them information. So it's a lot richer these days as far as, you know, the consumer data that we have, the business data that we have, and um, that information can help consumers make decisions, right? So if you're a consumer and you are looking for, you know, you want to get some cash from the bank and you're looking for an automated teller machine, like where are those located? You're using some sort of tool to help you find that if you're in a city you've never been to before. Or if you're driving and you're using some sort of navigation on your phone, right? You're, you're using that kind of data to make some decisions about which way to go, which route you might want to take. You know, if I turn right here, it's actually five minutes faster than if I go straight. That's the kind of information that you're getting. Uh, again, business decision makers, similarly, you know, they could be making decisions on where to open a new store, um, where to target their advertisements, which ways to route packages during a storm. And, um, and when we look at policy too, there's some policy implications and that's for governmental decisions. And that could be, you know, where to build a wind farm, right? Where to build windmills or where to build, as mentioned earlier, the cell towers, whether to approve that or not to approve that. Those are the kind of decisions that are being made. And again, social media drives that and the location data drives that. And essentially when you make a decision, you wanna have the most amount of information possible and understand what you're looking at to make that um, decision. So understanding spatial data um, leads to improved decision-making. And that's when using the location data effectively for your decision. So I think that's very important. So another way to think of it when we talk about this, um, this is not my quote, but, you know, sometimes people use this hashtag, everything happens somewhere, right? So if, if something's happening, it is happening somewhere. And by knowing where that is, that's where you can make these other decisions that you can do um, if you're just doing traditional data analysis and making decisions without looking at that spatial piece. So I think it's very important to dig in, understand uh, geospatial data. And I think there's a lot of value, especially for students, to understand these tools and a way to think through these tools. So if 
you know, you don't have to get um, an expensive uh, ArcGIS Esri license. There's a tool called QGIS, which is a free download. Um, there's also Cloud GIS that you can use. Um, it's a web-based tool, and you can do some mapping in Google Maps. Um, you might find some volunteer projects that for your community to do some mapping, and again, um, build your skill set. And again, I think that um, just makes you more competitive if you're on the market. Um, and also, you know, thinking about this data, like which techniques to apply. I see oftentimes uh, somebody will create a map and they'll use traditional data analysis. They'll present some sort of a map and you look at it and think, wow, you know, this what they're talking about really isn't um, solving anything or they're making some very common mistakes that we often see. Um, kind of a, a one that um, some of you may be familiar with, right, is where you have uh, a map, like a population map, and it's you know, the population of a country. And you know, there's a lot of people living in these cities and there's less people living here. And then you ask a question of, you know, where are the most coffee drinkers? And all of a sudden you see they're all in the city and they're less in the country. Well, all you're looking at is a population map. And you, you know, you, I see that so often where I see a population map being represented as something else just because the data map maps that way. Um, so it's, it's, like I said, I see those very common mistakes quite often. And, um, you know, those are the things you become aware of. The more where you work with this type of data. So as I go into this, I'm going to be using some words. I'm going to try my best not to use them, but just in case, I wanted you to be aware of them a little bit and kind of understand um, what I'm talking about, what I'm thinking. Uh, most of you have probably heard the term GIS. That uh, stands for Geographic Information Systems. There's lots of definitions for that, but essentially think of that as three pieces. Um, you know, there's a database component of it that's storing all of this location information, not just the attribute tables, but also the location information, like distances between points, that kind of a thing. There's also some unique analytic tools. So there's going to be some unique um, methods that you can use to analyze that data, like looking at distances between points, um, which is something that most other analysis packages won't be able to do. And there's a visualization piece. So you'll be able to visualize that information probably in some sort of cartographic method so you can make it look like a map. There might also be an animation component to it because we also have that dimension of time that we want to um, show and how things are changing over time. So the other piece I have on there is this uh, spatial decision support system. And um, I should have also described what decision support systems are, but essentially these are tools to help individuals, businesses, or policymakers come to a decision, right? You're looking at this, you've got some sort of a problem and you wanna come up with a solution. So at a high level, think of that as a decision support system. But now if we wanna incorporate the spatial aspect or the geographic aspect, that's when we put the S in front of the DSS and becomes a spatial decision, decision support system. And uh, I like the term, it's convergent. That's the point where things merge, right, where DSS and GIS merge. So some other things to think about is there's expert tools and non-expert tools. So, you know, you might need to be a geospatial expert to use some tools, and other tools are just definitely designed for consumers or business professionals, and they might have some sort of an expert system built in to guide people through that decision-making process or even AI, or they're just simplified enough so that people are hopefully making the correct decisions using the tool. Uh, another piece I have on here is geospatial data. So geospatial data can be points. Think of that as latitude and longitude, and you have a point and you plot it on a map. It's a dot, right? Um, you can have lines, and you can measure lines, distances. We know what points are on one side of a line, what points are on a different side of the lines. Lines can represent roads, rivers, that kind of a thing. And then we also have these geographic shapes, polygons, um, whatever you want to call them. And essentially, these shapes are going to represent things like cities, buildings, uh, lakes, oceans, that kind of a thing. So you have another shape. And here you can now tell, are there points inside of the shape <clears throat> or are they outside of the shape? <clears throat> so again, we have different types of geospatial data. It's not just points. It could be lines and polygons as well. And then we have something called georeference data. And when we think about, um, like if I post a picture to Twitter or Instagram, or I have an address, or I have a lot of information, I have basically an attribute table. Well, most likely I have some way of seeing that attribute row and finding some geospatial reference point for that so I can actually plot that on a map. <clears throat> so if I have an address and a person's name that lives at that address, I can find that point on a map based on the address. And now I know where that person is on the map. And now I can draw a distance between, for example, myself and Flavia on the call. We could say this is the distance between those two points um, on that map. And then we have a concept called geovisualization, which again is a cartographic represent representation of the data. So some sort of way of visualizing, it doesn't necessarily have to be a map. As I mentioned before, it could be an animation or it could be something more sophisticated like a cube. Um, that's just visualizing this data based on real space, right? So these are real distances between the points of the objects, which is interesting. <clears throat> and then I have, um, 
another notion. So you'll hear me say the word spatial a lot and geospatial. Essentially, in the purpose of this presentation, they are the same thing. And most papers consider them the same thing. Um, sometimes, you know, spatial can also be in psychology. It can be a, a kind of a tabletop thing, right? So we might say, um, you know, does when you think of the children when they have the toy with the different shapes and they put the shapes into the puzzle, whether they fit together, well, that could be a spatial um, reasoning type problem, and um, that's very different than spatial reasoning or geospatial reasoning when we go outside and now we're looking at objects in the real world. So that thinking can be different. So, but in the purpose of this talk today, you know, spatial and geospatial will probably be. All right, so I know I'm going over a lot to kind of get everybody's mind thinking about geospatial. We'll get into the um, uh, the detailed experiments here in just a little bit. <clears throat> so before we start to, I'm going to talk a little bit about some key pieces, and that is going to be the information presentation, like how we present this, uh, user characteristics, task characteristics, and then how we measure decision performance. And so this literature background is all on papers that have looked at the geospatial frame. They're looking at decision making, making some sort of spatial decision or geospatial decision. And um, these are some attributes that I just want to share that with you to kind of enrich the discussion just a little bit. So when we talk about information presentation, uh, generally that's going to be the visualization method or the tool that we're using to share this. And so in the past, you know, I've got a couple here, these are older, there's a couple newer ones as well, um, not that drastically different, but essentially you could use a GIS-based tool, decision support system. Um, you could be looking for addresses, you could be looking for things on a campus. I've seen that very often when you're looking at student subjects. Um, they could be comparing graphical interfaces, so they could be comparing charts and tables to maps and other visualization techniques. Techniques. Um, sometimes uh, information complexity is modeled, so the way the information is visualized can be more or less complex. Complex, and then also sometimes there's things about adjacency, so how close the objects we're looking at are in the real world or presented. Um, so sometimes adjacent information can make decisions easier or harder depending on what you're trying to do. So in other words, um, information presentation has been shown um, to improve improve uh, decision performance or have impact on decision performance. So I just want you to be aware of that. And that's kind of a key piece of what we're going to be looking at today. So another piece is user characteristics, right? These are the decision makers, the people, the individuals. And we want to understand, you know, what they're doing, like how are they making these decisions? How are they feeling about the decisions? Um, so sometimes there's these context-based approaches. So that's understanding, you know, this person is located in this location. This person has a lot of experience in doing this. Uh, this person works in a particular industry. Um, they have a background. They have education in information systems or geography. So that's a context-based piece. Um, there's cognitive-based pieces as well. So we can look at the cognitive abilities, the way people think, um, the load of the information processing load, like how much is too much, um, their motivations perhaps as well. So these are these cognitive approaches. So you're basically measuring um, <clears throat> the individual's thinking. And then there's others. So I kind of mentioned already a little bit, but um, how satisfied is someone with a decision? How satisfied are they with a the tool? The quality of the decision? Um, how comfortable are they using the tool? What's their self-efficacy look like? What's their motivation for finding the answer because um, you know if they really don't care about the correct answer then why are they doing this experiment you know, so really what's your motivation <clears throat> and then the last piece is this notion of fit there's a lot of fit theories and we'll get into those here in just a minute so that's about the user characteristic um, going a little bit further um, I'll just mention this because this is something that I worked on and that is um, this notion of you know spatial thinking like thinking about things in a spatial context and you will have this a little bit more now after this talk than you did prior to the talk uh, just because uh, you know just being aware of it is a big piece of it so if you know that these relationships exist and people can evaluate them um, you're going to be more prone to think about you know these problems in a different way um, there's also spatial reasoning and that is something that you can train yourself to do you can actually build um, stronger spatial reasoning. And then um, what I was doing is geospatial reasoning ability. So there's a couple of things when we look at spatial reasoning, uh, there's lots of different measures. There's probably five very common measures. Um, a lot of those were based on these tabletop exams, right? Where we do some simple tests and we see whether people have a good spatial ability. Like I could say, does this pen fit into this object or is it you know, too long or too short looking at it? And um, I might say, you know, this person has a really good spatial ability, so they should have really good spatial reasoning ability and they should be able to solve this answer. Of course, the problem was that these were looking at these tabletop exams, not necessarily real world geographic level thinking. And sometimes there's some some of these exams require some training or experience. So you read some of the exam questions and they might show you a topographic map of a mountain and they ask questions of which part of the mountain has the steepest slope. Well, you know, that might be great for someone who has worked with maps or 
or experience. But for many people who don't have that, um, that problem would be really hard to solve because it would simply be guessing. Uh, so, you know, there's some experience or some training required. And so, you know, they either needed a business context or they need to have some sort of geographic context to solve these problems. So, you know, what um, I worked on was to develop, and here's a list of all of them, and you can see um, some of the major ones, BZ2 and S1. Um, but essentially at the end, we kind of came up with some scales. And one of them was mentioned in the paper, which is a GRA scale, looking at geospatial reasoning ability, three dimensions of that at a geographic scale. And those are items that can work with any kind of a decision maker. It doesn't have to be um, someone who has experience working with uh, business data or somebody who has experience in the wilderness, you know, navigating outside or navigating a boat, anything like that. Um, so they're, they're just measures that you can apply, name the GRA scale. All right, so another thing I want to talk a little bit about is the level of complexity. And this is part of the task, right? You're trying to solve a problem. Well, the harder the complexity um, increases, the more important the need for presenting this information properly. And absolutely true with um, spatial presentation techniques and cartographic techniques as well. So I know a classic example that I can give here is if you look at, um, I mean, if you think of a city like New York, and um, or any large city that has a public transportation system. And you've probably seen these maps that show how to go from one train to another train or from one bus line to another bus line. And yeah, that's an incredibly complex system with multiple routes, different times. And um, presenting that properly to the decision maker is incredibly important because if somebody gets off of a train, they want to make that decision quickly and decide which train they need to switch to. And so presenting that in a nice, elegant, schematized way actually is the proper presentation method for that particular decision maker. Obviously, if you're trying to figure out which train to switch to which track on a more technical way, um, that is way too simplified. So you need a different type of presentation method. So yeah, there is um, complexity and some sort of a fit thing happening. And um, I think that's uh, important. So also related to complexity, I mentioned a couple of um, key papers. So some of them are older, right? So you're looking at electronic maps versus paper maps. Um, you know, something inspired did the um, you know problem complexity and looked at um, the way to show the data when it's incredibly complex, like simplifying the data, kind of like that subway map I was mentioning. And most of these had impacts on either decision time or decision accuracy. So complexity does matter when it comes to tasks. Of course. Tasks can have other characteristics as well, not just complexity, but um, I think that's a, a key one um, to keep in mind. And I'm going to share some other ideas with you as we move through this. So another piece of that is how do we measure decision performance? How do, how do we do that? Um, so the most common ones are accuracy. Was the correct answer? Was it the correct answer? And how long did it take to get there? So time and accuracy. But there's also measures of fit, regret, like did you feel like you made the wrong decision? And, um, you know, some of these studies I mentioned earlier, they did show um, impact on accuracy and time. So yes, we can modify decision-making time, predict decision-making time and accuracy based on um, various components, individual characteristics. We can do that using task characteristics or problem complexity. So you've heard me mention fit a couple times, and it's in the title of this presentation, but sometimes it's hard to conceptualize what is fit. And so I've got the um, dictionary definition. So it's to conform correctly to the shape or size. So it's something about things fitting properly, right? You want something to fit right. Well, there's a couple ways to look at fit, and that could be using categories. So, you know, it's it's you're trying to solve this problem. So this is the best tool for you. You know, you're trying to hammer in a nail. You're going to use a hammer. Um, you're trying to saw a board. You're going to use a saw, not a hammer. So you have these categories. And then you have this support fit, which is more of um, a psychological kind of like a, a feeling about you feel good about the fit. Um, sometimes that's good, and sometimes it ignores the effectiveness or the decision outcome. So, um, you know, I'm more interested maybe in the categorical fit for the research that I'm doing. And um, so there's something called task technology fit, which was developed by Goodhue and Thompson. Um, it's an older theory, you know, it's 25 years old. I think it's still um, relevant. It's been updated over the years. And, um, you know, I think it, it's, it's, and it can really help us understand spatial decision making. And there's another, there's a group. That one's at the individual level. There's one for groups as well, which is a little bit newer, still quite old. Um, that one I have not seen anybody use in the geographic decision-making world yet. So that would be an area um, to explore in the future. So it's all about the fit. And some of the questions we're trying to decide or solve is like, how can we better predict decision accuracy? We, we want to be able to predict which tools work best to drive decision accuracy. And then another way to look at it, maybe from more of a practical standpoint, is how do we improve decision accuracy? How can we do that? Um, what tools do we want to use? Um, what training can we give our employees? Um, what trainings what can we teach our students in school so they can make these um, better decisions? And of course, it's not just about accuracy. I mentioned 
That's the other piece. So again, we want to be able to better predict the decision time. Like, how can we make it so that a decision is reached faster? And also, how can we uh, improve the time it takes to come to a decision, and hopefully a correct decision, or at least a good decision? But both of those are quantitative measures. There's another piece of that, which is satisfaction too, because we want the decision maker to feel good about the decision they came up with. So same thing here, how can we better predict the satisfaction? How can we improve satisfaction? And then there's other variants of satisfaction. It's not just that you're happy with the decision, but maybe you regret the decision. Maybe you feel like you made the wrong choice or you thought about it more. Um, this could be important in a group setting where the group may have made a decision that is one that you don't necessarily agree with. So I think there's a little bit more that can be explored there um, of how satisfied um, the decision maker is with the decision outcome or the solution they arrived at. So based on all the stuff I've been talking about, you know, there's been some inconsistent findings in literature, and that's always a clue that there's something interesting to investigate. And in, in our case, you know, that could be related to the way they're looking at cognitive abilities. It could be because there's so many different visualization techniques, um, and the problem space can be different. We also um, found that visualization techniques weren't examined often um, in decision making, so um, especially, especially spatial decision making. So, you know, the way we present information, whether we present it um, in an animation, whether we present it in a cube, whether we present it in a map based, a schematized map with any data, satellite imagery, um, you know, that nuanced level of visual visualization is not studied very often. And also, I kind of mentioned the qualitative perceptions or that satisfaction piece. There's very little research on that. And especially in um, spatial decision support, there's very limited exploration of that fit concept. So how did that tool fit? Um, and you know, I think fit is an important theory when it comes to um, decision performance measures. So that is kind of the framework of the two studies that I performed that I'm going to share with you today. And I'm looking if there's any questions. I don't see any questions yet, so I'll keep going. All right, so the first experiment, and this was actually something that I did as part of my dissertation, I call it the apartment finder experiment. And I, like I said, I think that's the paper that um, it may have been shared with you. So let me just walk through that. Uh, and essentially apartment finder, we're trying to find an apartment for a friend. That's the way the study is working. Um, and we had a, um, a tool that we developed and I'll share an image of what that tool looked like for someone to find an apartment. And the story was that a friend was moving to a city overseas and you had to find an apartment for that friend based on the criteria that was given to you. And um, this was a friend that was gonna study overseas. So this was addressed to students and um, the sample was mostly students. So the goal here was to maximize decision performance. That's something we mentioned about. We want people to make good decisions and we want to make them quickly. Um, we looked, we knew that task characteristics influence decision performance. So we wanted to look at which task characteristics might make a change. Um, we felt that was important, kind of what we talked about earlier. Understanding location as a strategic advantage for organizations. So that was important to us. And there was very little understanding of how specific characteristics impact spatial decision making. So that set the tone of why we did this particular study. And we came up with a couple of research questions. So I'll go over these. I know there's a lot on the slide. We don't have to read all these, but um, essentially, you know. First thing was what cognitive abilities impact spatial um, impact of decision performance. So how is the user making a decision? What is impacting that? Um, we also looked at the fit of the technology and how it influenced decision making performance. Then we looked at two things about the actual problem itself. We looked at input complexity. So that is the number of possible solutions. So we increased that as well as some other uh, kind of almost noise, right? So we had some other variables that we increased. And um, we looked at problem complexity. So how can we make the problem harder and um, see what differences there were um, on decision performance or decision making performance? The theory we use for this where cognitive fit, so cognitive fit, I'm gonna talk about a little bit here in just a minute, as well as task technology fit. But cognitive fit at kind of a high level basically means that the presentation method, method that you're looking at, the way things are visualized, match the way it should be visualized to, to solve that particular problem, uh, to reduce cognitive load, make the decision essentially easier to solve. Versus the task technology fit um, essentially means that the tool is the right tool for that particular problem. So we looked at both of these. Um, we use a cognitive fit theory as our overall framework, but we actually applied measures for uh, perceived task technology fit. So using uh, one of the scales developed by Goodhue in 1998. And um, just so you have a good idea, this is kind of what cognitive fit looks like in, in the earliest version. So you've got a problem in the way the problem is represented, and you also have some characteristics of the task. Well, you're going to form a mental idea of um, the problem as well as a task to solve that problem. And you want to reduce the, the 
essentially the workload it takes to come up with that. You want that mental representation to flow easily. So the more often you do something, I think it's going to get easier and easier over time, and that improves problem solving performance. But also if the problem is presented in the best way that matches the characteristics, also that mental representation, that load to come up with that will be lower, also improving um, problem solving performance. So that's a high level cognitive fit. And later on, we'll talk a little bit more about the other fit. Now, this is just a, a diagram of the research model. We don't have time to talk about every single one of these relationships, but essentially, um, for those of you that are interested, I want to include this. But we were manipulating problem complexity and input complexity, and we were measuring decision time and decision accuracy as our dependent variables. So um, for the research project, we recruited uh, using social networks and group emails. Our sample size was 200. Um, most of them were students. So our subjects were consumers and um, it was voluntary. There was no money given to anybody and they completed this experiment called the apartment finder experiment. And then all of our analysis, there was a little bit done with SPSS, but almost all of it was using smart PLS, um, which is structured equation modeling package um, from Germany. And then um, we used a multi-groups analysis tool to compare different groups. So compare the, um, the model across groups to see if there were any differences. So for our experiment, we used a 2 pi 2 design. And this was actually tricky because remember, we're making it more complicated. Um, so we're increasing complexity um, across these different modes. And so the easiest one, we wanted to take less than 10 minutes, but still want to be hard enough. You don't want to solve it right away. We want to take a few minutes. But then for the hardest one, we wanted to still be less than 20 minutes. Otherwise, the decision makers are going to get fatigued, especially they're not getting any compensation. So why should they even do this? Um, you know, so it's we wanted to keep it less than 20 minutes. And but that made it challenging to kind of differentiate between the four modes. And let me talk a little bit more about those four modes. So here they're on a diagram, right? So we had a low input complexity and a high input complexity. We had low problem complexity and high problem complexity. And so here you see that two by two grid where we had both low input, low problem. And on the other end, we had both high input and high problem. And still, these are not drastic differences. There are no huge differences between the two because we still want to solve this in 10 to 20 minutes. We wanted this to still be simple, even if it was complicated. Hopefully that makes sense. And um, so on the right, we actually see the diagram now of what the students saw or what the participants saw. So we had a map. It's a, a fictional, it's a real city. It's an actual real base map, but it's a fictional university and a fictional apartments. Everything's fictional. None of this is real. And you can see in the example, I clicked on um, one of the beds. And of course, that bed represents an apartment. And we have some information about the apartment. Um, it's called Main Street Apartment. It's 280 euros a month. And the condition was excellent. So you could click on any of these um, symbols, like the restaurants, the, the pretzels represented, I believe, um, um, restaurants pubs, grocery stores. So you can click on the different things and um, it's Germany after all, that's why the pretzels are there. Um, so the thought would be you could go through this and hopefully find uh, a great um, apartment for your fictional friend. So for the low input complexity, we had 42 essentially points on the map. 12 of them were apartments. So you only had 12 possible solutions. For the high input, we had 84 objects on the map. 24 of those were apartments, so you'd have 24 different things to look at if you're actually going to look at every single apartment um, to make your decision. Hopefully the students weren't doing that when they were evaluating this, though. All right, so for the low problem complexity, remember, we're also tweaking how hard the problem is. So we used proximity criteria and attribute criteria. And I'll explain those in just a minute. And then for the high problem, we used four proximity and two attribute. So remember, we're trying to do this in about 10 minutes to 20 minutes. So that's why um, you know it's four, three to four and one to two, as opposed to three to 20 or something like that. Um, so let's take a look at what those look like. Um, so for the proximity, or I have it labeled as spatial criteria, um, there would be an example of statement of there must be a grocery store nearby. So if you find an apartment, there should be a grocery store near that apartment. So you need to use spatial thinking to solve that, right? So you look at the map and you're seeing, okay, are there any grocery stores near this apartment? And then the attribute information would be something like the rent must be less than 300 euros per month. So I'm going to go back to these slides. And so here on our diagram, we see the rent is 280 euros a month on this particular apartment. And I don't see any grocery stores near that apartment. Um, so, you know, that might not be the best solution. Again, spatial criteria or proximity criteria and attribute criteria were used. And here's our results. So very surprisingly, very happy with this, though. Everything loaded um, at significant levels. Again, I'm not going to go through all these different relationships, but um, we can definitely chat about this later on if you'd like. But here's some key findings that I pulled out. So, uh, for example, perceptions of task technology fit. So if, if the decision makers found that there was good fit, um, accuracy and time 
improved, like decision-making performance improved. Um, stuff that we didn't hypothesize were that we also found that gender did have an impact. So gender influenced um, both the fit perceptions as well as um, problem complexity also um, um, emphasized decision performance as in time. So um, those were interesting. And then we found that geospatial reasoning um, influenced decision performance, uh, both time and accuracy. So that was also kind of interesting. So definitely the fit and ability um, were important. And then the added value or the extra pieces we found were the gender differences and that problem complexity um, made differences on decision performance. So there's some problems with our study, though. It's not it's not ideal. Uh, one of those is that the complexity that we did may not be good for business decisions. I mean, we're looking at consumer problems are pretty simple. You're finding an apartment. Um, you know, there could be some additional consumer problems we could look at, like um, finding ATMs, restaurants, not just as apartment idea, uh, maybe something more relevant to the um, subjects. Um, we also didn't look at any geospatial complexity. So we had more points. We made you know, we added essentially noise, but we didn't look at things like um, containment, like is this point within this district or is there any kind of overlap? We also only used points. So we did not use lines or polygons and which are very common in spatial decision making. And we only looked at qualitative performance. So time um, and accuracy, um, we did not look at satisfaction. And um, we didn't look at cultural differences. So most of our subjects, I believe, were in the US um, and students. So we did not get a um, good idea of whether there would be cultural differences. Our sample just wasn't big enough. Um, we were hoping to look at that, actually. So that was our first study. Um, we had some implications of that. So we were able to extend cognitive fit theory, looking at complexity, decision complexity with both input and problem complexity. Um, we found that you know we basically had our subjects use both perceptual, that's using that spatial and the analytic because we're looking at the tables. So we had two different types of cognitive processes happening. And we also applied the geospatial reasoning ability scale on cognitive fit. So those were kind of our theoretical extensions. And then as far as practice goes or managerial, um, we found that you know, if, if there's higher geospatial reasoning, um, there are better, you know, perceptions of fit and performance improved. So if you work for an organization that is making spatial decisions, I think it's critical to train your employees um, and build this geospatial reasoning ability as a skill. And um, we also found some interesting things for developers. So for example, you know, by changing input complexity and problem complexity, um, you know, by having more points, for example, on that map, um, the decision speed dropped significantly. So maybe having tools that evaluate um, any of the solutions that don't make sense or are not part of the problem space, they could be immediately removed. Um, so we did, for example, in our um, apartment lesson 300, it would have been great just to filter out all the apartments that did not fit. So you only have the apartments that were relevant left in the problem. Um, so that would be an example of um, you know, something that a developer could add into the tool as opposed to showing um, all of the apartments. All right, so that was the first experiment. So that was the um, apartment finder. So for the next one, we try to resolve some of the issues that we were encountering. We really wanted to run an experiment and look more at some um, business problems. And you know, really, this is the coffee shop thing. We're trying to find where on a university campus could locate a coffee shop. And we wanted to find the best possible location on the campus for the coffee shop. And of course, fictional campus, fictional coffee shop. Um, our goal here, similarly, we want fast decision performance. We want to see if we could change the visualization technique. And um, really, we want to look at more of a decision, business decision versus a consumer decision. We want to use points, I mean, polygons instead of points. And we want to include more multi-criteria decision-making um, components to this one. So we add a little bit. Um, these were our three research questions. So we were specifically looking at the Matic um, presentation, so heat maps. Um, we want to see whether the, the heat map would improve decision performance. And of course, we're also measuring the complexity, which I'll talk about here just in a minute. Our theories that we approached were task technology fit. We also looked a little bit of um, diffusion of innovation theory and social cognitive theory. And um, if there's questions, we can get through those um, later on. I'm gonna skip over that for now. So here's a diagram of, of kind of an updated task technology fit. Um, so we have, you know, the task characteristics. So the pieces that, you know, what kind of a problem are you trying to solve? What are the characteristics of it? We have the individual characteristics. These are the boxes on the left. We have the individual characteristics of so the cognitive ability, for example, or, um, you know, the location, cultural background, gender. And then we have technology characteristics. And this is a tool that's being used. But in our particular case, it's more than just the tool. It's the visualization technique as well. So both sets of our subjects were using the same tool. They were just visualizing things differently. Uh, we evaluated the task technology fit. 
And then we have uh, performance impact. And uh, the original theory also looked at utilization. So do individuals continue to use the tool? Um, we weren't focused on that technology acceptance component. Um, but so kind of just the top portion of the diagram without the utilization. Here's our model. Again, we can go back to this later on, but we looked at some individual traits. I'm not going to explain what all the boxes mean, but essentially we looked at relative advantage on task technology fit and notice on our decision performance on the far right, we've got accuracy and time, but now we're also including satisfaction, which was a qualitative measure. We really want to add that in as well. So for this one, we used Amazon MTurk, which some of you may have already worked with. Um, we wanted subjects to have experience using mapping tools. We asked them to be familiar with Google Maps. Um, we used GIS Cloud to build our tool. We had two treatments. I'll talk about those in a minute. So we had a pretty close to even split, 132 versus 162. We compensated our subjects $1. And um, actually, um, shouldn't say apartment finder, I should say coffee shop. And we did our analysis again using Smart PLS. So you might be wondering about using MTurk, you know, for research. Um, you know, we found, I've done some other studies with MTurk, and I found it to be pretty good. Um, hopefully, you know, acceptance of, of that tool will get better or some other tools sort of using this model will, um, you know, come to fruition and we can use that. So there's some best practices to use. And I um, attempted to use all the best practices in the study. So in MTurk, the, the workers, as they're called, they can have different ratings. And if their performance is good, they may have a master rating. So in our particular case, every person had to have a master rating. We also included screening questions. So we asked them about whether they met, um, you know, to participate, whether they met all those values. And we even asked them whether they agreed to give us the best answers. We had those kind of questions. We included attention check questions. So at various points during um, the experiment, we asked them some basic things to see if they're just quickly clicking through or whether they're still paying attention. We included some open-ended questions where they actually had to type out some answers, um, some affirmation statements where before they submitted, they agreed to having answered everything correctly. And of course, we performed a post hoc analysis to see you know, if there were any groups that, for example, every answer was selected as you know, high or low or something like that, we eliminate those. Um, other studies have shown that um, MTurk can give you better results than student convenience samples. So their motivation might be a little bit better. And um, another study uh, conducted in 2014, I think this was a couple thousand people, um, they ran a fake experiment, but it had a attention check questions. And they found that 97% of participants answered those correctly. Um, in our particular case, 100% answered them correctly. Uh, otherwise, they were removed. So people, real humans are actually doing this and they're paying attention, which is what we want when we do research. So that's exciting. Um, and of course, MTurk allows you to screen so you can make sure that um, hopefully only the people that should be taking your um, survey or participating in your experiment are doing that. So our particular case was, again, find the best location building on the campus for a coffee shop. And we had some rules. The building should not already contain a coffee shop. That would make no sense to put a second coffee shop in the same building. Um, the building should have lots of students, so heavy student volume. And it should have good wireless because we want students to be able to sit in this coffee shop and um, you know, connect to wireless. And we gave them 20 buildings and only one answer, every building, I mean, only one would have the best answer. So there's only one building that has high student traffic, high quality wireless network and no other coffee shops. So the way you could solve that is you could click through every single building and kind of take down notes, but um, I'll show you the interfaces here in just a minute. Um, we use GIS Cloud, as I mentioned. We had a short training video showing how to use GIS Cloud. Um, and so those are about 30 seconds. It was a really easy tool to use, and that was our IT. And here's an example of what they look like. So on the left, we see mode one, which is our campus with our buildings on it. And if you click on any of those polygon shapes, it'll give you information. Mode two also included the thematic layer, so include the heat map. I believe in that particular case, we were looking at um, wireless capabilities. So we can see that building kind of on the top there, those two buildings together. That's It's got a great wireless network on both those buildings, actually. Um, so that would be where I would go first if I'm trying to find where to put a coffee shop. And you could turn off the layers, the heat map. Um, so I could also see where the heaviest student volume was and um, where there were coffee shops. And of course, if you're looking at where, you, where there are coffee shops, you want to use the darkest values, not the highest values, because you want no coffee shop. And um, this was a little bit more interesting. So we can see here our relationships. Um, uh, we did, again, we use relative advantage, but we saw that had an impact on task technology fit, somewhat of an impact. Um, our R square value is really low, but we did see that um, there was an impact between task technology fit, again, on decision accuracy and decision satisfaction, but not on decision time in this particular experiment. So um, reviewing the findings real quick. So mode two, the heat map um, was more effective than mode one. And this is the most interesting thing. Accuracy increased from 37 to 50%. And while there's an increase, 
it's shocking how bad 50% is. So people spend 20 minutes of their time, answered the stuff correctly. I mean, they had a, a text box they could fill in information to talk about. So they took the time to answer about their process that they used. Um, but 50% got it wrong, even in the in the second version of Motu. Um, and decision time was not impacted. Um, I would think that you know with the visualization techniques, we could quickly narrow down um, using the, the heat map and find out which buildings to start looking at. Um, but clearly, I think even with that information presented and the training on how to use that, I think people still were going directly to looking at the attribute value of each building. And um, decision, decision satisfaction did not increase um, between the two modes. Um, there was a relationship, but it did not increase between the two modes. And um, yeah, keep going. So um, yeah, let's get that. So the research questions, you know, does use of thematic visualizations improve performance? Yeah, they do. Um, decision accuracy did improve. Um, however, not satisfaction decision time. Um, which factors? Um, so prior work really said that um, self-efficacy um, did not have an impact, but we found it did. And we also found as an impact of relative advantage on task technology fit, um, which I think was new. And then which factors um, differed between the two presentation modes. And unfortunately, between the two modes, when we did a multi-group analysis, there were no statistical differences between the models. So while there were outcomes that were different, the models behaved identically between the two. And so here, um, we're looking at a couple of things. We've got the heat map visualization, um, which is new. So we could definitely do more with that. We can add additional types of um, visualization. Uh, we could look at groups as well, because remember, these are just individual decision makers. And if you're determining where to put this coffee shop in the real world, you'll probably have more than one decision maker involved. Uh, we also um, could work with complexity, increase complexity a little bit more. Um, we could look more at motivation. Here, their motivation was a dollar, you know, to receive a dollar and just the um, interest in doing the study. Um, and we believe a lot of people are actually interested in coffee, so they like to participate in this. And um, there's probably some heuristics, right? So maybe a building that looks big and does not have a coffee shop, like it's big size wise, um, maybe the evaluators looked at that and said, wow, this is a big building. It needs to have a coffee shop, as opposed to looking at which buildings had the most student traffic. So I think cognitive heuristics um, do matter and play a role. So um, scholarly wise or implications, we address the gap of looking at different visualization in our particular case heat maps. Uh, we also performed um, an empirical investigation of decision satisfaction, which I believe was the first in a research study um, using spatial decision making. Um, this, um, again, um, heat maps do improve decision performance, at least accuracy. And most people understand how heat map works because they look at weather maps and they can tell, oh, it's gonna be cold or hot. Um, so that's good. There's been some training, I will, if you will. Um, and, um, you know, I think that needs to be some help, um, some expert systems or some AI or something like that, that can improve that number from 50% to something a little bit higher. So that opens up an um, area for research. So as we conclude, let me go through some summary items. Um, overall, so um, we're looking at visualization approaches as a technology characteristic. So, um, you know, technology could normally have been, you know, we're using a GIS versus uh, Excel or some other type of charting tool or Tableau, but now looking at the different types of visualizations, I think adds an interesting um, research area. Uh, we looked at decision satisfaction as an outcome, so that's new. And I think that is an um, important piece to making these types of decisions, especially in groups, um, which hasn't been done yet. And um, we were still unable to explain the low performance. So why are people not able to solve these problems? That's still a, a gap in the literature um, and probably explains some of the inconsistency we saw in the, in the prior work. So for practice, um, yeah, there's um, different visualization techniques do matter. And so, you know, if there's one that's more effective than the other, that one should be used in the tool. But we found that decision maker probably does not know which tool is best for the problem they're solving. So that should either be maybe an intelligent agent of some kind or some expert system or some sort of training to help individuals understand which particular visualization matches the problem that they're trying to solve. So I think there's a gap there. And kind of summarize everything. Um, you know, these are the four areas I thought would be interesting to go with this in the future. Um, so the first problem, of course, we talked about 50% uh, accuracy. Uh, that's not very good, right? Um, they could be guessing, and they'd still be that. Um, so um, you know, that's uh, for a simple problem like we have, 50% is quite low. So how do we increase the decision accuracy, especially on these simple problems? Um, another area to explore are the cognitive heuristics. That's kind of what I mentioned, where somebody might be looking at the size of a building. They might be looking at streets, parking lots. Um, you know, you might look at a satellite image and see few cars in the parking lot because the image was taken very early in the morning. You might draw from that that there's not a lot of people at the store, which is not accurate at all. So there's a lot of 
these things are happening. Um, a road where a river might look really wide um, versus in reality, um, there might not be a lot of traffic and it's easy to cross. Um, so there's some cognitive heuristics that are happening when people are making these decisions. Um, our complexity too, we've kept it very simple, but you know, I used wicked complexity, but you know, what if we made some really hard problems that take hours to solve, you know, as a team, um, you know, how do, how does that matter? And do people come up with better answers when the problems are complex? Um, I think there needs to be a lot of work done with that. Do that, you know, maybe that's a case study, maybe that's a small group experiment or um, some sort of a, a qualitative approach for an experiment as opposed to quantitative. Um, and the last piece is this group decision-making. So it's not just groups of people, but it could also be groups as in virtual, kind of what we're doing here, or physical, all in the same room. Or it could be that you might have an AI or something else that plays a role in the group decision-making process. So I think these are four areas that would be um, quite rich to explore um, with this work going forward. So if anybody's interested in this stuff, do let me know. Um, I'm happy to either share some ideas or collaborate on projects. And that brings us to the conclusion. And so I've got some photos of my co-authors up there. Um, that's Alex McDaniel and Mohammed Koja, um, Don Gregg, and Jahan Karimi, um, who helped with this work so far. So um, thank you for letting me go through this. And I, hopefully this was interesting to you and informative. And hopefully I can um, answer your questions or um, just talk about this a little bit more. So thank you. I'll hand it back over to the host here, Flavio, who wants to take over. Yeah, Michael, thank you very much for the talk. It was very lightful. Uh, I mean, I, I know some of the work, so it was really good to revisit a little bit, understand from your perspective, right? Because uh, as a as a, as a like a, someone who is actually uh, looking at the work is different, mm -hmm. and uh, see the way how you did, the way how you used the methodology, it was really really good. And before I go to the questions, I would like to know if anyone from the audience wants to open the mic and just make the question by yourself, or. Well, I have a question here, Michael. Just, I was just curious if these uh, Mechanical Turk uh, people, uh, if you gave them a few more, another couple of dollars for, if they were right, if you think that their decision would be better. What I mean is, would they be more committed and that, that help them get a better decision? Yeah, that's a great, uh, that's a great idea. That's something I have not yet tried. I'm sure there has been some studies that looked at that and that, you know, I think that's definitely the way to go um, is, you know, influence them, you know, maybe say it's a dollar for participating, but $5 if you participate and have the correct solution. And actually Mechanical Turk allows you to do that um, because it has essentially, I'm trying to remember the name of the feature, but it's almost like a tipping feature. So afterwards, after you can actually look at the data set and you can provide more payment to the person. So the mechanism is there, so you could definitely do that. Yeah, I, was, I wasn't sure if the mechanism would be there, but- Yes, so it is, yes. Yeah. <laughs> this probably will lead you to this so, to some interesting uh, conclusions. Yes, there. yeah, yeah. So I think that would be a very, very good way to go um, and hopefully bring those numbers up. But like I said, I, I feel like based, you know, this is just my perception. I don't have any data to back this up. But based on, you know, when they answered questions about their progress or the process that they used, I could really tell that they did spend time going through this. And they did spend, you know, it was really evident that they cared and they, they thought they had the right answer um, in many cases. Um, and so my fear would be if you gave them the extra five dollars, they would spend, you know, maybe two hours on the problem <laughs> as opposed to 20 minutes and really try to. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't know. It would be interesting, um, you know, maybe to have still, time. I mean, if, or if that would lead them to better to, to better results, you know, because uh, I was also very, uh, I the 50, well, the 50% uh, let's say correctness is not really just by chance, right? Because they had Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I said that incorrectly. It's not, it was not a 50-50. You're correct. Yeah, yeah so, but I mean, still, it, the, but still. <laughs> it still seems, I mean, I looked at that and I said, gee, it's just three layers of filters. If you put the three layers, the, the answer is, seems to be almost immediate, right? Yeah, well, and, so almost, because remember, the one of the filters is reversed. Okay, so, yeah. So you have two filters that would match up and the third one would be the opposite. So that I mean, would maybe be, that would be something for you to also to check if they were mistaken because of that. You yes, know, if, yeah. Because then what really means is that your geo uh, information is being presented them, uh, to them in a way that it tricks them instead of yes, helping yep, yep. them get into the answer. Yeah. That's a very good observation, yeah. And we did look at the data to see if, um, you know, if the result that we would get had we done that was being selected, and unfortunately it was not. So even the best answer based on what you're saying still wasn't what they were selecting. So, <laughs> but that was we thought that too. It was like, maybe that's what they're doing, but you're right. Um, maybe they were correcting it in the wrong way or something like that, yeah. A great observation. Okay, so we have uh, we actually have a question from Lucas here in the chat. Lucas, okay. if you want to open the mic and just do it, feel free. Or I can read it. Yep. Hello, Michael. Hello, Lucas. Uh, I will read, read, read because my English is very bad. It's, it's, <laughs> and, English is great. 
<laughs> Michael, on conclusion of the article, is that men perform just special tasks better than women. Uh, what do you, do you believe this makers should do with this information? Okay, yeah, that's, that's a good question. So, you know, I'll actually, you know, point out a couple of things related to that. So one is that um, in the psychology literature, when we look at spatial problems, um, that is basically a known thing so that um, that women um, tend to do not as well when performing um, spatial problem solving than men do. Um, but lately there has been some um, conflicting research in that. And actually a, a paper that um, related to geospatial decision uh, making that I um, had published, I think about maybe a few months ago, actually found the opposite result in that women were better at uh, making decisions in that particular case. So I, I think I think while the majority of evidence shows that the um, um, men were better decision makers, maybe that is no longer the case. And I think that's something that should be explored a little bit more. Um, so for example, one thought of that might be that you know, men um, may have served in the military, and um, also men may have, you know, joined like Boy Scouts or something like that, where they're learning these geospatial skills. There's also some sports that um, use this, these techniques, you know, everything from um, sailing, boating, scuba diving, um, which are also kind of male dominated sports, perhaps. Um, so I think that's probably where that might be coming from. Um, again, that's not my area of expertise as far as that, but. Um, could a decision maker do with that information? Um, that's a great question. And, and so I think the, the answer to that is developing the tools in a way that the gender no longer matters. So I think that's really, you know, we want to, we're technologists, right? We're, we're in IS or IT, and we really want to make sure that we develop um, visualization techniques or tools and technologies that eliminate that gap, if there still is a gap. So that's my answer to the question. And I see a comment here um, that contradicts what happens here at home, but it could be because I'm married to a geographer. So um, that's very funny. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, thank you very much. Hi, nice, Michael. Thank thank uh, yeah, absolutely. Luke. Yeah, so I think that we have a couple of questions here. We can address what, let's let's try to address, address them one by one. So yeah. mm -hmm. start for this one, this year. Yep. I see, if I, I see that there is one there that is very similar to mine, so possibly. Uh, yeah, we did it. <laughs> we did it. Yes, so Michael, this one, uh, I have worked with uh, ASR, I... Esri, always, Esri, yep. Mm -hmm. Esri, yes. We always run into having to do a lot of configurations. When do you believe that this complexity will be removed from this environment to bring more productive gains to those who use this type of systems? Okay, so we yeah, have. Thank you for the question. Um, so yeah, Esri, for those of you who are not familiar, that's I mentioned a tool called ArcGIS, and that is the company that makes that tool. Um, I was running to having so yes, um, configurations. I'm just reading the question again. Um, so yeah, so I, okay. So the question I think really is when you're talking about solving these problems and you know configuring the tool to the problem. I think you know that's one solution. So you could definitely improve simplification by having different systems for specific problems. Um, I'm not sure if I like that particular um, solution, but I'll give you a great example. I, you know, I mentioned the subway map, for example, in New York. Um, you know, if anybody's been in New York, you've probably seen that map that has all the different lines or any other large city. Well, that's a great map again, but um, now if you're trying to find the best restaurant or find a restaurant, using the subway map is a disaster, right? That would never, <laughs> it might get you into the right neighborhood, but it would never help you find a restaurant. Um, the distances don't make sense, for example. Um, you would know where the stations are and how to transfer between the lines, that's about it. So I think there really, there's kind of two answers to this maybe. So the first would be that I think we'll see more tools that are specific to certain problems. And then the other piece of that is that um, we might see tools that help the decision makers remove the complexity. Uh, and that could be by answering some questions, um, you know, or looking at the data that's being analyzed um, you know, kind of the example that I had, the apartments that were more than 300 euros a month is sort of say, are any of these attributes used in the decision? And you could say, yes, the cost is. And then it could be, well, is there a you know, value that should be excluded or included? You could select that and automatically the tool could then essentially filter out those values. Um, so I think the trick there is, um, you know, most of these tools already have a filtering capability, but making sure, under, making sure the user understands how to do the filtering or to prompt the user to do effective filtering. And I know the question is specifically says when. Um, so as far as a timeline or anything like that, I'm not sure if I have that. Um, but you know, I think as these tools evolve over time, we'll see that kind of divergence that I talked about, um, where you have these specific tools and um, the sophisticated tools getting smarter at presenting that information and better and helping the con user configure it better. Hopefully that answers the question. Okay, Michael, thank you very much for mm -hmm. this one. 
and uh, I will just remove it. I will just move this one because it's related to uh, other channels. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so let's go for this. I think it's similar when you control it. Uh... Yeah, so um, we did control for gender, and we did notice um, that there were those differences. And so um, those were not in the two studies I talked about. Um, they were expected. So we knew that gender does have impact on um, um, spatial reasoning. And so it was not surprising that they had impact on um, decision performance. Um, so like I mentioned, I did have that more recent study um, that actually found the opposite answer. So I think um, this is something that we'll probably see over time. And, and kind of the example that I gave was you know the military background or the you know, navigation, the sports, those kind of things. Um, you know, I, th I think we'll see those changes over time. You're great. So the next, uh, just give me a second. Yeah, take your time. Yeah, the next one ah. is, uh, so do you think that cognitive fit could be used to associate two concepts that would be not related to each other at first? For example, for instance, digital transformation evolves. Okay, that's a good question. Um, so cognitive fit. Um, so we're looking at, okay, so two different concepts like digital transformation DevOps. I, I think they're different concepts. They're, they're clearly related. Um, yeah, I, I think on both of these, if we're looking at, this is hard to answer because, you know, task technology fit, I think we're really looking at, at that specific IT artifact and digital trans transformation and DevOps, De DevOps, sorry, are so broad, you know, they encompass more than just one tool. So I think our um, unit, of, we would have some issues with unit of analysis of using those theories, either task technology fit or cognitive fit theory out of the box. So using those theories without making some modifications to them. Uh, so I think variants of it, like, Using that theoretical framework and applying it, yes. Um, I think maybe more so with the task technology fit um, and looking at those specific artifacts or looking at a category of artifacts um, that are part of that digital transformation umbrella, or you know, using DevOps as um, you know, because DevOps has a lot of components as well. That could be individual characteristics, right? There's some training component and some understanding, and even for digital transformation, I think there's. Um, um, like a level of acceptance or motivation to participate in those initiatives because you have some people that are going to be very excited about those initiatives and want to contribute and want to push that forward. But then you're also going to have some resistors and laggards, right, that don't want that to happen. They're more comfortable with the way things are being done. So I think you would see both of those also having some of those individual characteristics. Um, yeah, I think apply that theory um, with some modifications, maybe focusing on a single IT related to those and really looking at the individual characteristics. I think that would be valuable. And I have not seen yet good question yeah great one indeed mm -hmm. so the last one uh why do you think that so many people got it wrong mm -hmm. the best decision for the cafeteria problem considering that all the, the graphical information was there for almost simultaneous decision for a little trained mind Okay, yeah, that's a good question. And I think we talked about this a little bit. Um, you know, the, the thought was maybe maybe um, using, I mean, so let me kind of go back. If you were not using the heat map, you had 20 solutions. And of course, you could go through each of the 20 buildings and narrow down which ones didn't have a coffee shop. Then you could go through those 20 buildings again, but you had to make a decision of which value is more important to you. Um, you know, the, the wireless network connectivity or the student traffic. I think that was one piece of it. So maybe the answer, I mean, it was designed to only have one clear answer, but um, maybe um, individuals use those heuristics and put some other thoughts into it. Um, so for example, you know, the buildings have names and if a building is named something um, like student center, Maybe you know somebody evaluated that and said, "Oh, the student center should have a coffee shop." Um, you know that could be one way. Um, another way it could be kind of what we talked about earlier, where um, maybe individuals did not know how to use that thematic or the heat map um, to remove um, information. So existing coffee shops, maybe they're looking at that incorrectly. That might have been a part of it. And then also, you know, maybe a building is further away from other buildings, and if anybody's used to a campus, they might say, "Wow, all these people don't want to walk so far." So again, they might want to put a coffee shop in a building that's further away from all the other buildings um, just because they think they might um, capture more potential customers that way. So I think that the, the challenge is related to heuristics. I think also because satisfaction was so high, the, the subjects felt that they did um, solve the problem correctly. And when, they, when you read their, their notes of what they did, they also feel like they did it correctly. So I think they were also adding in some of these heuristics I was talking about, where they're looking at this and based on their own experiences, their own backgrounds, their own university they're familiar with, um, making some um, you know, suggestions of, okay, this building name should be this. Maybe the building shape had something to do with it or how many floors the building had, because I believe that was in the attribute data as well. You know, This is a five-story building versus a one-story building. Um, so I think a lot of that um, uh, may have played a role. So 
Um, yeah, this is a great question and um, something that hopefully we can solve. Um, and I think the heuristics is definitely something that needs to be looked at quite a bit more, um, especially in um, analyzing and making decisions with any kind of data presentation, whether it's geospatial or, or just traditional data. Michael, uh, in, in operations management, uh, when they, they're talking about the value for the customer, they say that the customers are, uh, well, at least that there are some authors that consider that customers have some use, some qualifying criteria, mm -hmm. and, and then some real decision-making criteria afterwards. So the qualifying criteria would, would, would be like the 300 euro price. If it's more than that, it's out, right? Yep, yep, uh, yep. When you, uh, and, and then the, the, the real decision-making is done after, or, or at least, uh, or and only among those alternatives that still meet all the qualifying criteria. Right? Correct, yep. Uh, and uh, what I was thinking here while you were uh, speaking, if, uh, uh, from your experience, do you think that most of this geospatial information or, or criteria, they're more like the sort of qualifying criteria or they're the actual decision-making criteria? Mm -hmm. So in good general. question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in general, I mean, in our particular case, in these studies, um, you know, I think those are the same. So our qualifying criteria, if you would have followed that, you only would have had one solution. They were designed that way. Um, but I, you're right. I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of that happens. It's related to the heuristics, perhaps. But, um, you know, once, you know, these studies didn't do it, but maybe a future study could, where you would now have four possible solutions, right? Four candidates. Um, and now you just have to evaluate them on information. I think that's very realistic. I can see, for example, uh, that uh, some people would decide, no, I don't want to live in that suburb because that part of the city is dangerous. Yes, but, yeah. You yeah. know, uh, you, you, don't, you don't determine that in terms of uh, kilometers to a place. I mean, maybe one side is more dangerous than the other, but how, you know, how far can you go and you still... So there's a lot of cognition there that is hidden in the decisions and Correct. that would possibly still need to be mapped somehow uh, in a way that we know is that criteria. Well, the way people decide is, well, if the name of the suburb is that, it's completely out. Or mm -hmm. if the name of the suburb is uh, still maybe seen as a bad suburb, but then I go there and I look that it's already in, a, in an area that is closer to a nicer area, then it's acceptable. So it's, it, in fact, is it digital or is it analogical? You know? Yes, yeah, yeah, that's great, great comment. I totally agree. I think that's something that needs to be explored. So that's kind of why I think this area still has a lot of room for um, research opportunities. I found very interesting the, the, I think the last slides anyway, in one of the last slides you actually mentioned that the lack of performance uh, can uh, need more uh, AI or expert, expert yes. information systems, right? And uh, I just recently, I think it was last week, I read, actually I read a long time ago, but I, I revisited last week, this paper for from uh, Uma, I think it's Urama Hai, something like that. He was the senior editor or he was the editor-in-chief of the MISQ. Uh, I think two, two years ago, mm -hmm. and he wrote this editorial about the the rule of techno uh, the rule of AI in decision making. So he actually classified in three different types. I this, yeah, so this uh, we should not go for this one. But mm -hmm. I, I, I I want to ask you what are the, the your impressions or on how AI can actually uh, you know improve the performance of decision making with people. You know, with, uh, in what kind of uh, environment, what kind of char characteristics we should looking at when we are dealing with this? Uh, do you have any, uh, any thoughts on that? Okay. Uh, no, that's that's a great question. And so when, when you know, when I think about the AI, it, it's, you know, it, it can do a couple of things, right? I mean, it can get you to the solution, but that's not really what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about helping you um, understand the problem space better so that you understand um, which techniques to use to um, visualize, um, which data, like what data to remove, what not to include. And, you know, th there's mechanisms to do that that are well known, right? There's techniques and steps that you do best practice, but I think decision makers don't necessarily know those. And so that's where I think the value would be is if the AI or the expert system or whatever it is um, could help you evaluate the the, the problem space, understanding what you're trying to solve, what kind of problems you're trying to solve, um, you know, kind of what we talked about earlier, the, 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 you know, when are you actually making that decision? Are you removing values until you get to that decision? Or are you uh, making a decision early on? Like figuring out what that sequence of events is to get you to that decision point and narrow down those values. I think that would be um, kind of what I'm envisioning. Um, obviously, AI can go all the way, right? So you can just dump this data and have it give you the output. Um, theoretically, of course. And so the thing is, is you know, what is better? And I think the human decision piece is going to be a critical piece of that, the cognitive decision making, um, because you will have to make those other evaluations too, right? There's going to be something, um, you know, like we talked about a little bit with the neighborhood or understanding a road. Um, you know, you, you probably know a street where, you know, nobody wants to actually cross that street. 
in real life because it's a psychological barrier. And only if you live in that city, do you know that nobody would ever cross that street, um, even though it has a crosswalk, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, so I think there's always going to be something that you do want to bring in these other things, um, this other experience, these past experiences that you have. Um, I think that makes the problem much richer. But the key to it is is having the process outlined of how to get to that solution to make sure that somebody is not making a mistake by interpreting the wrong information. Um, somebody's looking at the data correctly. Somebody's not ignoring a critical attribute. Um, I think that's something where a system like that could learn and understand. Um, for this type of decision, this is a key attribute. You know, you, cost was a critical piece of that, or or the, um, the materials used was a critical, whatever that might be, as to help the um, decision maker understand that. That's my thought. I mean, <laughs> you might have other ideas. So if, if you do, I'd love to hear them too. <laughs> no, no, it was amazing. The the the, 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 the actually the, the argumentation it was really good. I mean, uh, I have been thinking about this. Uh, maybe it's, uh, I have been working with digital, digital transformation, and we have been thinking also how can we make a bridge between AI and digital transformation, and how can this can actually work together uh, in the sense of uh, uh, improving the performance of the decision making within organizations and. Uh, yeah, what is the actually the, the what is the actually rule of uh, AI in the decision making? You know? Yeah, yeah. You mentioned that uh, we need we need to have the human. We still need to have the human for making the the critical decision. But uh, how can we ensemble or how can we enhance the decision making uh, mm -hmm. between, through the interplay of these two elements? It's one of the really good questions that we are trying to answer uh, in our uh, in our work here. And uh, yeah, so I think I think I quite think the the task and technology fit is one of uh, one approach, one theory that we can use for mm -hmm. uh, examining this uh, this this, um, this question, mm -hmm. and also to evaluate in what kind of task AI can actually uh, contribute. You know, and uh, yeah, it was a very good. We, we can discuss this afterwards. Oh yeah, uh, of course. Yeah, I, yeah. I might have make, I might use your experience with this. Uh, sure. Testing. Yeah, yeah. I'm happy to. And I was going to say an example that um, I would do is is you know sometimes digital transformation or you know why does a human need to be involved in that decision? Uh, you know, an example that I sometimes use when I explain it is um, let's say we're building a windmill, right? You know, like an electric power windmill. Um, you know, you're you're. AI or your decision matrix, whatever you're using, can come up with the best solution for you. But if that is going to be in the mayor's backyard, it's probably not going to happen, right? So I think that you're always human piece um, to help. There's something wrong here. We already know this is not going to work out. So exactly, exactly. Okay, Michael, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Has uh, any question or any comment? Any other comment? Thank you for all the feedback from everyone. And it was a real pleasure to be here. So I really do appreciate it. And if you do have more questions for me, um, you can definitely find me on LinkedIn and connect with me um, or just email me. You can find me, you know, MTSU, Middle Tennessee State University. My name is, is not very common, so it's easy to find me. <laughs> Maybe it's time for our photo. If, if exactly, want, exactly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, we have very shy students, but some of them show up. <laughs> okay. We always have a photo because this photo is featured at the end of our video, you know. So, yeah, yeah they're there. It's great to see everyone. Yeah, that, this is the way we usually finish our right. uh, talks, uh, Michael. Thank you very much again. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Flavio, for, for bringing Michael to talk to us. And we'll pleasure. see each other next week, right? Uh, with our one before the last uh, research seminar. Okay, so see you guys. Okay, thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye, Michael. See you. Bye. See ya. Students that are doing this for credits, but yes. we also have uh, lots of uh, research, researchers and students that are just interested in the, the topics that we're presenting every week, and okay, then great. they uh, and then they 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 show up for for the event. But sometimes they can't be here at this right time. So we say, don't mm -hmm. worry, we have what we call Lacais Tube, Lacais okay. is the Latin America and Caribbean Association for Information Systems. We have a channel on 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 YouTube, and uh, so you will be featured in our Lacais Tube uh, uh, meeting of this week. Okay, okay, great. <laughs> And I just realized here that today I entered with my daughter's account. So that's why oh. we're seeing Qualquer Latitude there. That's, uh -huh, yes. that's her, her blog. For whatever reason, okay. she was here in my computer before me and I didn't see, but it's still me. <laughs> this happens to other faculty in uh, our institution here as well, where I notice they log in with their, either their spouse's account, their wife or something. <laughs> and, and you know, when we do that through Zoom, I'm very fast in changing. But here, mm -hmm. uh, I think it would take me half the, yeah. the, the program <laughs> only to fix that. So couldn't bother. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just going for the for the schedule. So Michael is the our uh, 
it's ours. Yeah, so 11th uh, seminar. We're going to have a next one next week, and then we're going to have the closing sessions in two weeks uh, from here. Uh, as Alexandre keeps saying, we're going to have a very special guest. So you should you know, not. Know, someone spoiled that, Flavio. Uh, this morning, I had a Brazilian researcher sending me an email and asking me, is it true that this person is going to be oh. uh, with you <laughs> on the 16th of December? And I said, come on, how could that have happened? But I also keep the suspense, right? Okay, that's <laughs> good. I learn about it, but I also keep the, the suspense for now. Yeah, we, we already have some hints. The guys, the, the person is working in the field for the last 50 years. We just said it's a man. So this, I think with these two clues, you can you can figure who is uh, the... Who is uh, you have three people in mind, maybe. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure.